willing and obedient. Man, that, after that worship session, I have mixed emotions of crying and thanking out to the Lord and also an energy from the Lord ready just to punch the devil in the face after that worship because I'm ready. I'm sick and tired of seeing people in strongholds. I'm sick and tired of people in addictions. I'm sick and tired of people confused about their identity. I'm sick and tired of broken families. I want to see the name of Jesus Christ impact this community and this country and this world and we're going to fight this battle. Before we get into our sermon, um, Travis Marcus, uh, one of our youth students, he's, uh, he's created these different um, plaques for you guys um, as donations. We as the youth department uh, have a goal to raise $20,000 by the end of this year, um, yes, for an organization called Speed the Light, uh, which helps uh, different ministries across the world get, um, well, get the help that... Uh, they need in different ways. So one at one ministry is World Serve. Um, they help provide uh, fresh water and wells in different places of Africa and across the world. Um, and another one is Project Rescue, which helps uh, fight against sex trafficking. Now our goal is to raise twenty thousand dollars so we can give ten thousand dollars to World Serve and ten thousand dollars to Project Rescue. So if you could help Travis Marcus, who's out there. I think there's going to be some other students who may be out there this week and throughout the weeks as well. He doesn't have a set price on them. He says, just give what you feel like the Lord's called you to give. So if it's a dollar, two dollars, two hundred dollars, I don't care. Um, we, we're just asking for your help today. And I'm so proud of these students here in Quakertown and Pennsburg that they are so empowered by God to hit this goal, to, to see lives changed. In the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have a question for you guys. Have you ever heard the saying, it's time to face the music? Ever hear that saying? I, I've heard it from time to time, but I was curious to see um, a little bit more about this, where it came from. And I came across an article that explained how this phrase came to be. And many years ago, a man wanted to play in the imperial orchestra, but he couldn't play a note. Since he was a person of great wealth and influence, however, he demanded to be allowed to join the orchestra so that he could perform in front of the king. The conductor agreed to let him sit in the second row of the orchestra. Even though he couldn't read music, he was given a flute, and when a concert would begin, he would raise his instrument, pucker his lips, and move his fingers. That's crazy. <laughs> he went through all the motions of playing... But he never made a sound. This deception went on for two years. And one day, a new conductor took over the Imperial Orchestra. He told the orchestra that he wanted to personally audition all the players to see how well they could play. The audition would weed out all those who did not meet his standards, and he would dis dismiss them from, from the orchestra. One by one, the players performed in his presence. Frantic with worry when it was his turn, the phony flutist pretended to be sick. The doctor who was ordered to examine him, however, declared that he was perfectly well. You're, you're jumping the gun on me. <laughs> the conductor insisted that a man appear and demonstrate his skill. Shamefacedly, the man had to confess that he was a fake. That was the day he had to face the music. The article concludes with this. Many people go through the motions of the Christian life. They attend church or youth group, recite Bible verses, and say all the right things. In reality, though, they are fakes. And there is a time, a time is coming when everyone will be called to stand before the judge of heaven and earth and, quote, face the music. No one will be able to hide in the crowd. The phonies will be separated from the true players. I start off with that because... I think we as the church need to remember that the time is near. The time is near when the Lord Jesus Christ will make his return. And last week, with over 1,700 people between both campuses, we celebrated the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And 40 days after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven and promised that he will be returning. And this promise was made over 2,000 years ago. And as each second, minute, hour, day, month, and year go by, 
he draws closer and closer and closer to his return. This morning, my hope and prayer is that you see and hear the words of the Lord and know that they are trustworthy, that his return is soon, and that you are invited to come live in the presence of Jesus Christ forever and ever. So you don't have to fake it anymore. You don't have to pretend that you have it all together because Jesus knows that we don't have it all together, but that we can humbly come to him because of his grace and mercy, knowing that he has forgiven us for all of our debts and trespasses. And that one day, one day, that glorious return of Jesus Christ will come to restore all things. All things. The question is, are you ready? Are we ready? Are we ready as the church? So if you would join with me in Revelation 22, we're going to look at verses 6 to 21. Revelation 22, verses 6 to 21. This is what the word of the Lord says. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angels to show his servants what must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you your brothers, the prophets, and those who, keeps, who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he said to me, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the unrighteous go, in, go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the cities by the gates. Outsides are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Both the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to take the water of life freely. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city which are written about in this book. He who testify about these things say, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. If you would join me in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you that by your grace we have the freedom to gather here to worship your holy name, Lord God. Father, what a blessed time last week to to remember the resurrection of you, Jesus Christ. That you have conquered sin and death, Lord God. And that you did ascend back into heaven to leave us the gift of the Holy Spirit to, to proclaim the kingdom of God. So that one day you will gloriously return, Lord Jesus. Father, it's been over 2,000 years since that time, Lord God. And each day, minute and hour and second go by, you draw closer and closer and closer. Father God, I pray that through this message tonight, Lord God, that you use me as a vessel, Lord God. And help us to recognize, Lord God, that we do not fall asleep to the fact that you are coming soon, Lord God. That we do not get tired of hearing that you are coming soon, Lord God. That we not become lazy of knowing that you are coming soon, Lord God. But that we run the race and we finish the race well for your glory 
and for your honor. God, we praise you and we give you all thanks. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to break this down into three categories. And the first one is called the words of Jesus Christ are faithful and trustworthy. The words of Jesus Christ are faithful and trustworthy. Again, in Revelation 22, verse 6, it says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angels to show his servants what must soon take place. And as I was going through this one last time here this morning, uh, preparing for today, the key, there's a key word that stood out to me earlier, and it was must. What must soon take place. And not, it's not, it may take place, if it takes place, I may change my mind, it must. Must. All the things of the prophecy and revelation will need to take place. And when Jesus returns... He is known as the faithful and trustworthy one. In Revelation 19, 11 through 16, we get a picture of Jesus' glorious return. It says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes wars. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written on that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name, is called, his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Be faithful and trustworthy. And I know that in the context of this, we're reading about Revelation here, but this same principle of being faithful and trustworthy is found throughout the entire Bible. Listen, those who are skeptics of Christianity, those who are skeptics of, Bob, of the Bible will say that the, that the uh, Bible contradicts itself, and it doesn't. It doesn't. The Bible doesn't contradict itself because in 2 Corinthians 1.20, on the promises of God, it says, for every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, we as the church also say amen to the glory of God. So when we believe in the promises of Christ, when we believe that he is faithful and trustworthy, when we hear the truth of God's word, we proclaim amen and yes as an agreement to that God is faithful in his promises. And many promises of the Lord have come to pass. We can start right in the beginning of Genesis. I think of Joseph, Joseph's dreams. Yeah, couldn't even say Joseph right there. Um, Joseph's dreams. Right at first, it didn't look pretty good. He had this dream, and he, God gave him a vision of what's going to happen, but it didn't look very good in the beginning. But in the end, God was faithful and trustworthy to provide the vision that Joseph had. God was faithful to free Israel out of slavery in Exodus. God was faithful to allow the Israelites to enter in the promised land that is found in Joshua. God was faithful and trustworthy that David became king, found in 1 and 2 Samuel. God was faithful and trustworthy to see the temple built by Solomon in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. God was faithful to see the captivity and the freedom of Israel from Babylon. And God was faithful to the first coming of Jesus Christ. And that means he will be faithful and trustworthy to the second coming of Jesus Christ. With this, we can rest assured. We can rest assured that he will come through. And we hear this all the time, you know, and this is my prayer that we don't get cold to this, but we say it, Jesus is coming soon. Can you say it with me? Jesus is coming soon. He is. And in Revelation 22, it says it multiple times here. Verse 7, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this book, of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, 12, look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his works. Revelation 22, 20, he who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Now, what can happen sometimes, because as I said, it's been over 2,000 years. Some people are like, is he though? 
is he? Are, are we sure that he's really coming? And, and, and sometimes, if we're honest to, with ourselves, we look at the chaos of the world in today's culture and around the world, and sometimes we can have these little doubts of like, really? When are you coming? Anytime now. But why the delay? Why, why the delay of what's happening before Christ's return? Well, we get a glimpse of this in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 3. And Peter actually uh, tells us to be aware of those who will scoff at this. So let's look at this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own evil desires, saying, where is his coming that he promised? Who's heard that one before, right? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They deliberately, this is, this is key, they deliberately overlook this. By the word of God, the heavens came into being long ago, and the earth was brought about from water and through water. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay in his promises, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but to all, all, to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day in the heavens, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of the God and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. See, the Lord delays in his return out of love, out of grace, and out of mercy. We just read in here what the day of judgment is going to look like. The day of judgment is going to look like where fire and anger and all the heavens and the elements are going to burn up. This earth is going to be no more. And we read here that God is not a, an angry God. He's not an evil God who just wants to see everyone not in communion with him, that he wants to see everyone go to hell. No, he is patient in his delay. He is patient in his second coming because he wants to see all. He wants to see all come to repentance. Now, does that mean that's going to happen? No. There are going to be some, there are going to be many who will not want anything to do with God and turn away from God and will have to deal with that on the day of judgment. But until that day comes, until that day comes, we still have a job to do as the church. We, as the church, we were just singing, I want to speak the name of Jesus. I want to shout it from the mountains. I want the whole country, we want the whole world to hear the name of Jesus. And that the question is, are we shouting the name of Jesus with eagerness? Are we shouting the name of Jesus with anticipation of his second coming? Because as Jesus said, the day of Noah will come. When Noah in his time, when he was the only righteous man in his day, he built the boat. He built the ark that God called him to build. And everyone scoffed at him. Everyone said, what are you doing? This is not right. And then the day of judgment came and the door was shut. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a day when the door will be shut. And our hope and our prayer as the church of Jesus Christ is that we take as many people onto the ark uh, into the new heavens, glorifying Jesus Christ and not in eternal judgment for the rest of their lives. So what is this repayment? And I kind of talked about it here a little bit because God says here in, uh, in Revelation that he is being patient because the Lord will repay each of us for our works. But this works isn't, isn't a work for salvation. We don't earn salvation, Right? Salvation is a gift from God by His grace and His mercy. 
But this works is defined as how we live our lives. Right? In Romans 2, verses 6 through, through 11, he will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who, by persistent in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory and honor to peace for everyone who does the good, does what is good, sorry, does what is good first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for there is no favoritism with God. And, and here's the thing. I, need, I just want you to focus on this a little bit. This isn't saying this is going to be an easy journey. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say being a disciple for Jesus Christ is going to be a cakewalk. Which I never understood. What is exactly a cakewalk? Are you eating cake when you're walking? Like, I, I, Anyways. This isn't going to be a cakewalk. But in Revelation 22, towards the end, it says this, Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right up to the tree or life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Listen, there's going to be time, and you, we, we're seeing in our culture more and more with the way media is, to just, hey, come to this Come this way. Come to the dark side. Come to the dark side. And Jesus is pulling. No, no, no. Stay here. Stay in the lane. Stay on the path. Stay on the narrow path. Because it even says in the later times that even those who are saved may be deceived. So we must be careful as well not to be deceived by Satan. We must not be deceived by his schemes. But we must constantly, constantly be looking at Jesus Christ. We must constantly be going to His Word. And in the time of struggles, in the time of discouragement, in the time of when things feel like are way too chaotic, we have hope. We have hope. We have hope in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why when, th- when we mourn for those who are Christ followers, we mourn with hope because we know that Jesus is coming. Paul himself said about the resurrection. We get excited about the resurrection, right? We love it because we know that Jesus defeated death, conquered sin, and and we get excited about it. And Paul says that there are people who who mock the resurrection, who don't think it happened. And Paul says if the resurrection didn't happen, we are to be pitied. But if the resurrection happened, which it did, then we know that his second coming will happen as well. And we can have hope in that. We can look at the craziness of this world and say, yeah, it's a little chaotic right now, but that faithful and trustworthy rider is coming down. He's coming down. He's going to speak the words, and it all ends. And he, his kingdom and his reign will last forever and ever. And my question is, will you come? Will you come? If you, if you don't know Jesus, will you come and join us in this? In Revelation 22, verse 17, it says, Both the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let anyone who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Now there are two things here that we see that says, Both the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Come. See, my hope and prayer through reading God's Word is that the Holy Spirit is working in your lives and that the Holy Spirit is revealing the truth to you and that you know this morning that Jesus Christ is the way, He is the truth, that He is the life, that no one comes to the Father except through Him and that He doesn't want to see you stuck in your sins. He doesn't want to see you stuck in your addictions. He doesn't want to see you stuck in your brokenness, but that He wants to see you restored. But we as the bride, as the church, also have a, have a role to play. And we who preach, those who are disciples, those who go out and teach God's word, we do this, we say all these things because we're saying, come, 
Come, come experience the presence of God. Come and, and experience the glory of Jesus Christ. Come and experience the freedom from your sins. See, I, I think about this. This picture stays in my mind. And I, I'm going to just share a personal story why and, and how it relates a little bit here, hopefully. Um, in college, I was a, I was a cross-country runner. Any cross-country runners, track and field runners? No, okay, I'm the only one in here, great. Um, um, I ran cross country and track and field in college, and uh, a cross country race was uh, five miles. No wonder why I'm the only one who wants to run, okay. Um, it was a five mile race, and, and, and five mile races are hard because you need to pace yourself, but you also need to do it in a fast way as well. It's kind of like it's weird to explain, if that makes sense. It's a pace, but you got to go really fast at the same time. But one of the things my coach, uh, Coach Badway, probably the greatest coach I've ever had, he always told me when I would run, I, w I would always run like this. Faster. This is just a walk. but I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I would run with my head down looking at my feet. A and Coach Badway would always say, Mike, you're losing traction by looking down. You need to look upward to see where you're going. You need to look upward to see who your next um, person is that you are going to pass. You need to look up. All right, look up, look up. And so I would hear all the time, Kubis, look up! Kubis, look up! Look up, Kubis! Okay, I'm looking up, looking up, looking up. And we had a race uh, out in Gettysburg. And I felt really good on the starting line, and I, I was like, this is going to be probably one of my best races uh, of the year, uh, and it was. But there's something about a five-mile race that Coach also told us, that at the mile to the last 800, 800 to a mile is when you just go. You just, you let whatever else you have left, you just let it go and just run. And Coach, we're at the mile, 800 to a mile left, and Coach Badway goes, Kubis, I know you're tired. I know this has been a long race for you, but Kubis, you have your best race in front of you. You need to pick it up, put your head up, and go. Go. All right, I'm going, Coach. Going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. A lot faster. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, I'm like, and I see, the, I see the finish line right there. And I see Coach, he's jumping up. He's like, go, Kubis, go, Kubis, go, Kubis, go, go, go. And I'm just, I'm like, I've got it. Probably not as dramatic, but you, you get the point. <laughs> and I get through that finish line. I'm tired. And I'm exhausted. And I'm like, and then Coach Badway, he just comes over from behind. And he picks me up out of excitement and of joy. And he said, my goodness, that is your best race in your collegiate year. I am so proud of you. Now, I don't say that to, to, to go back to my glory days in college. But since I became a Christ follower, that image has always stuck in my mind about coming home to Jesus. See, I, I, I want to finish the race well, and I know that the Christian race is a marathon, but we also need to have a mindset that we're in the last 800, that we're in the last mile, that we give it all that we got. Because I don't want to just slide into heaven safely. Whew, I made it. No, I, I want to run into the Father's arms. I want him to know that I use my gifts. I use the talents that he gave me for his glory, for his honor. And I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I want all of us in here to run in there to the Father's arms and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm going to close with this, because I, 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 really, I, I really believe that the Lord is saying to, to keep this message short, but, but come and have some time of, 
altar time and, and worshiping a little more time here this morning because I believe this. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back, and we as the church need to be ready for that, but we as the church also need to be empowered by His gifting through the power of the Holy Spirit to run this race well, to run this race with our eyes looking at Jesus, not looking down at the chaos of this world, not looking down at our past, not looking at fear or destruction, but having our eyes set forth, set forth on Jesus and his heavenly place. Because when we keep our eyes on Jesus, we're able to love on those who are around us. We're able to show them, hey, I'm not walking in despair. I'm not looking down, not knowing where I'm going or what's ahead of me. I'm looking forward knowing, yes, there's all these things going on, but before me is heaven. Before me is Jesus. And I want you to come along on this journey. And so... So if you're in here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, my hope and prayer here today is that you have one with him. That the Holy Spirit, whether you were here last week or you've been here for a while or this is your first time here, I want you to know that Jesus isn't just the big guy upstairs. He he is your friend. He is your Father, He is your Savior, He is your Lord, and He is right there beside you every midst of the battle and circumstances in your life. And if that's you here this morning, you haven't had that personal relationship with Jesus, we want you to come to the altar. But I also want us as the church, if you're brave enough, if you're brave enough to this time, because we're, we're about to sing a song of worship to the Lord that says, I will surrender it all. We will make room for you, Jesus. We will, we will lay it all down for you. Will you join me this morning here, worshiping the Lord with, on your knees and saying, Lord, you can have it all. You, you can have my life. You can have my work. You can have the sports that I play, the the extracurricular activities in the school that I'm part of. You can have my children. You can have it all. And know at the end of the day, you'll be glorified. You will be glorified. Will you also consider running this race at the end well? Listen, I, I don't, I never... You know, I I hear of all these different things that are going on with different pastors across different churches, and it's sad, and it breaks my heart. And I I get fearful at times, like, Lord, what if I don't end well? Like, I I don't want to, I want to end well. And I want to see all of us in here end well. I want to see all of us in here not be held back by fears. Not be held back from past experience. Not be held back by strongholds. Not be held back by any lies of the enemy. But to move forward. To advance the kingdom of God here in Quakertown, in Pennsburg, in all the surrounding areas. And say, God, have your way. Have your way. It's not us. It's not what we do on our own strength. We can't punch the devil just with our fleshly hands. We do it by putting on the armor of God, by going to his word and say, devil, you can't have the families here in Quakertown. Devil, you can't have the families in Pennsburg. Devil, you can't destroy the lives of those in this area, Lord God. Devil, you can't have the poor. Devil, you can't have the rich. Devil, you can't have anyone because we will proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. So will you join me? Will you join me at the altar here and say, God, I give it all to you. We make room for you right now, Lord, as we get ready for this time of worship, Jesus. Father, our hearts break for those who are lost. Our hearts break for those that don't know you. Our hearts break for those who are confused by by their identity, Lord. Jesus, we need you. We can't do these things on our own. We can't move mountains here 
in our own strength, but only by the divine power of Jesus Christ. So Holy Spirit, have your way. We ask you the greatest gift that Jesus gives us is the Holy Spirit to do great things for his kingdom. Will you just come? Will you come and empower us, Lord God? Will you come and help us reach the lost? Will you help us reach those who are worried, worried, those who are broken? God, we need you desperately. And now during this time of worship, we are here to make room and give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.